Every year, the flu epidemics in humans around the world is a type of flu, we call it seasonal flu, and this is flu that is transmitting from human to humans, and these is, this is how those epidemics spread. Every few decades, however, there are things that influenza virologists call influenza pandemics, and this is a situation when a type of flu that circulates in some other species, like for example pigs or in birds, transmits to humans and then starts spreading between humans. The last influenza pandemic was in 2009, um, and in the past hundred years there have been three other influenza pandemics. These pandemics can be very dangerous to humans, in particular because, and also unpredictable, because not only do we not know when they might happen, but it's also very difficult to know how severe they might be. There are some types of flu from other animals that are really not particularly dangerous to humans at all, and there are some types of flu that are really very dangerous to humans. One of those is colloquially called bird flu, and the particular type that is very dangerous to humans is this type of bird flu called influenza A H5N1, known colloquially as H5. It's unclear how many humans have actually been infected with H5 over the last 15 years. It might be as few as about a thousand. What we do know is that about 600 people, well, we don't really know it's 600 people, but we know that about 600 people, as far as we know, have died from infection with this particular type of bird flu with H5 over the last 15 years. So this virus can be very dangerous to humans, and an absolutely key question to know from public health purposes is whether or not this virus could actually start transmitting among humans and spread worldwide. These people that have died from, and most of the people that we know who have got bird flu so far, the virus has not actually spread from human to humans. At least we're not certain that it has, and it certainly hasn't in a very broad way. So one of the key questions that scientists have been looking at over the last 15 years is whether or not these viruses ever could transmit from human to humans. And the recent work by the Fouché laboratories and the Kawaoka laboratories have shown that indeed these viruses could potentially transmit from human to humans. We don't know this. They've done their work in ferrets, which is a really good model of human flu. And most influenza virologists now think that it is indeed possible that these viruses could transmit from human to human, with potentially as few as maybe around five mutations from the bird virus as it is right now. One of the key questions then is whether or not when one of these bird viruses infects a human, whether or not they could act, that those virus, those mutations could actually evolve in that human who's just been infected from the bird. This is the question that we've addressed in this study, and we've done that in collaboration with these two laboratories, with the Fouché Laboratory and the Kawoka Laboratory. And we've addressed this question about just how much of a risk is there of these H5 viruses becoming transmissible be among humans in two ways. The first thing that we've done is we've looked to see whether or not any of these mutations are already out there in nature. The viruses that Fouché and Kawoka started off with were just two particular viruses chosen because they're very well-known viruses and very well-studied viruses in the influenza world. The second thing we did is we looked to try to figure out, using mathematics and computers, whether or not if a human or a mammal were infected with one of these viruses, is there enough time during a typical flu infection for that virus to evolve three, four, five, six mutations, however many it would actually take? So the first key part of this question is what's already out there? So to investigate what had already been seen in nature, we analyzed all of the surveillance data on influenza H5 viruses that have been collected over the past 15 years, particularly emphasizing the viruses that have been collected from birds and the viruses that have been collected from humans. And what we did is we looked at those viruses to determine which of the substitutions that had been identified by the studies from the Kawaoka lab and the Fouché lab 
had already been seen in nature. And of those substitutions, had any of them been seen in combination with one another? What we found was that two of the substitutions that had been identified by the Fouché and Kawaoka studies were common in nature. And surprisingly, of those two substitutions, there were a number of viruses that had, been, that had both of those substitutions. Those viruses have been isolated in over 30 countries around the world. So the other thing we then did is we looked to see whether or not those remaining substitutions could evolve in an individual who is infected with one of these bird viruses. This is a combination of figuring out how do viruses actually evolve within people. It's a combination of figuring out um, all of the different aspects of that and then constructing a mathematical model and a computational model to see whether or not during the course of a typical influenza infection in an individual, is there enough time for these mutations to evolve? The way that we did this, and we don't yet know enough about these particular viruses and how they will um, evolve during the course of an infection in a human, but what we can do is we can look at factors that one would expect could make that more possible and factors that would make it less possible and try to judge these factors against each other. And we found that there were six factors. These are factors that people would already know about but not know how important they are relative to each other. Six factors that could make it more likely that these mutations would accumulate within a single host. The first is just the fact that the virus mutates when it replicates within a host and just the, the random accumulation of those mutations. The second is, is if there's any positive selection within an infected host. So this is where if the virus gets a particular mutation, then that mutation will be favored, potentially because that particular strain of the virus then within the host is more adapted to being inside, inside the human. And so that then the virus will grow a little bit more faster and preferentially and will be selected for. This is standard evolutionary process. The other thing, of course, is that if the infection is longer in an individual, then there's more time for the virus to evolve within that host. The other is if there might be more than one way to achieve what is functionally needed for one of these viruses to become transmissible from human to human. Interestingly, the Fouché study and the Kawaoka study, they didn't find exactly the same mutations, other than in one particular case, but they did find ones that might be functionally equivalent to each other. And the more different functionally equivalent ways there are to get these mutations, the more likely the virus is to evolve in an individual. The other possibility is that some of these mutations might already exist in birds, but actually we don't really know because they just exist maybe as a small proportion of the, all of the viruses that are in a particular bird. And so if a human were to get an infection from that bird, we might think that they're only getting an infection and those mutations aren't there, when in fact they might be there in small proportions. That would clearly help as well. And the final one that might help is whether or not, instead of just having time to evolve in one person, whether or not if the virus was then transmitted to another person, could we get some of the mutations in one person and some in another? Now, it's less likely that the virus would transmit to another person because these viruses aren't easily human to human transmissible yet, but it would be something that could help. So these are the six factors that, of course, they can all help. And interestingly, they all have around about the same they all have around about the same effect. And each one of those has quite a substantial effect. What we don't know is how many of these are actually playing a role during the course of a single infection. And we don't know that yet because this is really just, not enough is known yet about how these viruses will actually evolve within humans. But we know that almost certainly some of these factors are gonna play a role. 
Because on the other side, there might be things, some things about these viruses evolving in humans, which means that in fact, it's gonna slow down or restrict the accumulation of these particular substitutions. One is, if humans have a great immune response, it causes a really short infection, there's just less time. We do, however, know that there are humans who have longer infections um, with flu, so that's not gonna happen all the time. The other key ones, it's two others, they're kind of related to each other, and that is whether or not some of these mutations are not advantageous in humans, which we already saw would speed things up, but actually would slow things down in humans. Technically, this, these would be called intermediate, deleterious intermediate mutations. Another one is not that those mutations are deleterious, but they might have to happen in a particular order for that virus to actually survive within humans. Interestingly, we found that the deleterious and the ordered mutations don't have as much of an effect at slowing things down as we thought beforehand that they might. Um, so when we look at these together, we can't say definitively how much risk there actually is that these viruses would, is evolved in humans. And we can't say that because not enough of the biology is known yet, not only about these H5 viruses, but about, about some other aspects as well about how these viruses evolve within humans and how they would transmit. And this is really important follow-up work that can potentially be done in order to really try to narrow down and make a more accurate risk assessment of how well these viruses can or can't evolve within humans to potentially be able to, to spread between humans. In the paper, what we've done is we've tried to be as accurate and as precise and as definitive as possible about what that risk is, whilst at the same time making clear what are the unknowns about this, this risk. And the bottom line is, is that we can't say definitively yet. More science needs to be done about understanding these viruses. What we can say, though, is that if, the, if a particular virus needs, let's say, five mutations to evolve in a single host, it's gonna have to take a pretty strong combination of those factors that we talked about before that help the virus evolve within the host for that to actually happen. If it's just three mutations, though, some of the ones that Colin has said are circulating and have circulated to some degree, that's a more likely thing to happen we just don't know how likely yet. Basically what it does is it brings it into the realm of possibility, the realm of possibility where we really need to be paying attention to this. And the next thing that we've done in the paper is we've said, well, okay, given that we see now that this is actually a possibility, what work that's already going on, or maybe new work that should be going on, could be prioritized to help both be able to a better and a more accurate risk assessment and also to potentially ameliorate this risk. So in terms of things that can be done to better understand the situation and to ameliorate some of these risks, we need to have a better understanding of what's out there. So the surveillance data that has been accumulated already really is the backbone of the study that we've just done. But as always, we need more surveillance data. So we need it not only in birds and in humans, but also in non-human mammals that have been known to transmit H5 viruses in the past, and which may serve as a potential reservoir for H5 viruses into the future. And so here again, as always, additional surveillance is a strong way forward. And another thing that needs to happen in surveillance is that in addition to the type of sequencing that's done currently, which is basically where when uh, you have a virus sample, you sequence the primary virus that's in that individual. There needs to be what's called deep sequencing done on a substantial number of samples. And so in deep sequencing, you actually sequence a, a number of viruses that come out of an individual host so that you have a picture of the viral diversity inside that host. And in doing that, what we're looking for there is we're looking for the presence of the substitutions that were identified by the Fouché and Kawaoka studies that are present 
in an infected host, but they're below the level which would be detected by the type of sequencing which is done currently. So we need more surveillance in uh, humans and animals, and we need a different and deeper type of sequencing for the samples that are collected. And this is particularly important for samples that are collected from humans, because one of the things that we find uh, from our analyses is that the longer an individual has been infected, the more likely it is that those mut mutations would be to accumulate within that host. By taking, by doing deep sequencing on multiple samples from an individual at multiple time points, we can get a more accurate picture of how those mutations are actually accumulating during the course of an infection. That's right. And of course, as we mentioned earlier, it's not just the mutations identified by Fouché and Kawoka, but also, and as they point out as well, it's potentially functionally equivalent mutations. And the science already out there that tells us what some of these functionally equivalents might be, um, it's important to understand that better and to potentially look for some others and it's also important to talk about the other stuff that we mentioned before. Which of these mutations within a mammalian host would actually likely to be advantageous within that host and thus be potentially selected for and how strongly selected for? So these are things that one can estimate, but for particular mutations, it's potentially really important to know, again, to be able to get a better assessment of what the, what the true risk is. And the last one, and one of the most difficult things to understand given the current state of the art, is key factors related to the transmission of influenza viruses. How efficiently influenza viruses transmit from mammal to mammal, and exactly which viruses within an infected host might be or might not be preferentially transmitted. Pulling all this stuff together in terms of getting an assessment for this really key question of could these H5 viruses actually evolve in nature? We now know not so many mutations and that they could possibly evolve and we'll know more accurately how possibly, how much more possibly in the future. So to wrap up then, the situation that we're in right now is that there was this key question, can these H viruses ever evolve such that they could transmit among humans? Because if they can, then we need to be, we need to really know that in order to be prepared and potentially mitigate this, this risk. The work from the Fouché and Kawoka laboratories have now identified what mutations would be needed, or at least one two sets of mutations that would be needed to make this happen. And the work that we're talking about here shows that these mutations, given that some of, the, some of them are already circulating in nature, could potentially involve, evolve within, um, within a single human host. So we now know there's a risk. We can't say exactly what that risk is in terms of be super quantitative about it yet. We're kind of in the situation that one might be when one, one has recognized, for example, there is a particular risk of an earthquake or a tsunami in a particular region. We don't know exactly what that risk is yet. We don't know exactly when and where, but we, we are starting to get an idea for how to actually, um, for, for exactly what that risk is, and importantly, we now know critical things to do to really try to get a better assess assessment of that risk. And of course, if you can do that, then you can potentially ameliorate that risk.